Good morning. Good morning. Um, I have to always say my second favorite church because I was at Godspeak Calvary Chapel with Pastor Ron McCoy. So I'll get in big trouble if I say my favorite church here. It's okay, okay. Uh, wonderful to be here with you guys this morning. Um, if you don't know me or my story, it's been a while since I've spoken here back in 2020. It was actually like a few weeks before the 2020 election, right? The most reliable election that's ever happened in all of human history. Um, <laughs> And so just a, a brief little primer to just introduce myself if you don't know who I am because this church continues to grow because of the faithfulness of Jack Hibbs and the entire leadership here because courage is an incense and courage, like cowardice, is actually contagious, amen? Uh, and uh, I think we've been seeing that in this year and the last few years and thanks to the faith, faithfulness of this church. But I've actually been a pro-life activist since I was a fetus, um, <laughs> long time. Um, and I'm, I'm actually not joking. I didn't just say that to get a laugh, but uh, you see, my mother was the director of a pregnancy resource center uh, in Azusa, California, right across the street from APU, actually. Uh, by the way, never send your children to APU, amen? Yeah, really bad. Conversation for another time, anyways. Uh, and so she was the director of that center while pregnant with me, and I've been reliably informed by the, the fall of the science, um, Anthony Fauci's and Francis Collins and the entire liberal establishment, I've been informed uh, that there's only one body, right? What's the entire rallying cry of the pro-abortion movement? My body, my choice. And so the same people who said that a face diaper will protect you forever, that, that quadruple, well, I, I don't want the YouTube stream to go down, um, will protect you forever, um, will also tell you the baby's not a baby. It's just a blob of tissue. It's actually, it's actually pregnancy tissue. Uh, it's just part of the mother's body. And, and so therefore, according to the law of transitive property, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. So if the body in my mother's body was her body, then there was just one body, which means that I was my mother's body, which means that every baby my mother saved through abortion, I saved <laughs> through abortion. I mean, that, that follow the science, right? So I've actually been a pro-life activist since I was a fetus. And I grew up in Whittier, California. I was homeschooled through eighth grade. I went to Whittier High School. I did my senior project on abortion. Oh, Whittier High, amen, yeah. And uh, that Whittier High School told me, you can't pick the topic of abortion. Sorry, we have our senior project guidelines. Oh, look, you can't pick that topic. And I said, I, I'm embellishing a little bit, but I said something along the lines of, uh, here's a copy of the Constitution you're making me read in government class. I recommend you read it or you're gonna have a lawsuit on your hands. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, 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 I did, I actually did threaten a lawsuit to, uh, to Whittier High School as a senior there. And, um, and they were like, oh. Ah. And so then I did my senior project on the issue of abortion. And, and then a, a, a young woman who was a couple years ahead of me who grew up in the same church I did came up to me. She said, hey, I heard you did uh, abortion, pro-life for your senior project. When I was a senior at, at Whittier High School, I told them I was gonna do it and they said I couldn't pick it. How did you get away with it? I was like, and you let them. So it's actually, it's, a, it's an important lesson. It's kind of like a small vignette that when you stare little Anthony Fauci want to be tyrants in the face and say, sit down. Um, they often do because it's just a projection of strength of an inner weakness, amen? So then I went to Westmont College in Santa Barbara, California, which is actually worse than APU. Never send your children to Westmont College, good Lord. Um, but I didn't know that when I got there as a naive 19-year-old. And I started the first pro-life club that had ever existed at Westmont College. Took me a full semester to find a faculty advisor to get the club approved. I asked student government to let me bring an abortion display in my freshman year, my sophomore year, and my junior year. And they said no all three times. And then I learned that Westmont College hires pro-abortion professors. And guess how I know that? I had debates with them via email. And I'm gonna, I'll put them in a book one day. I have emails of faculty teaching professors at Westmont College who signed a statement of faith who defend abortion. They don't just say, oh, I vote for Democrats because I'm whole life and they do better on other life issues. No, they say, no, a woman has a right to abortion. Uh, and, and so then I learned that Westmont College takes no position on the issue of pro-life. So I stood outside of the dining commons as a junior at Westmont with dead baby photo signs of mutilated children killed through abortion to show my alma mater what they were supporting and tolerating in their midst. So then they came out and they said, you can't do this display. And I said, oh, I, actually, I looked at your student handbook and I'm not breaking any rules because I didn't ask my club to stand with me. So I'm just a tuition paying student exercising my right to free speech. And they were like, oh, uh, uh. And then after two hours of debate that I had a GoPro on, I recorded the whole thing, they admitted that I wasn't breaking any rules, but they said, Seth, we feel like you're disrespecting us. To which I said, and I feel like you're disrespecting the aborted children who are probably killed at a greater rate at your university by Christian students because of your silence, tolerance, and hiring of pro-abortion professors in your midst. So anyways, that's my background, all right? Uh, and then I'm speaking in 2020, and then the scamdemic and everything gets shut down. 
And then this woman named Gina calls me of Real Impact, and she's like, will you come speak at Comeback California? And I was like, sure. I mean, I've always wanted to meet Jack. He's kind of an earthly hero. So then I speak at Comeback California, and then I, and then I preach here on a Sunday, October 2020. So I just want to tell you this as a sort of just a brief introduction and primer. Because of the love and undeserved kindness of Jack Hibbs, Rob McCoy, and Charlie Kirk, my ministry got more kerosene poured on it in 2020 and 2021 than I could possibly explain to you. And I've been in more pulpits on the issue of pro-life in the last two years than any speaker or pastor in the world. Um, and because I know all the pro-life speakers. So that's due to this church. And then Jack was like, hey, let's support you. So then all of 2021, people would be like, Seth, will you come speak at our young people and get them equipped in sidewalk counseling and pro-life and defend life? But we don't have the funds. We're just a small youth group or church. And Jack's like, we got it. So people have actually been raised up into sidewalk counseling, trained outside of abortion centers to defend life, equipped to defend the unborn, and inspired to actually do more than confess pro-life beliefs because of what you guys have enabled me to do through my ministry all around the country. So I just wanted to thank you, and it's wonderful to be back here with you. And I, I think it's providential, by the way, I think it's providential, by the way, that I'm here on Sunday, November 13th. I was supposed to be here November 6th, last Sunday. And then Jack's team called me and said, hey, can, can you move to the 13th? Well, this is the first Sunday gathering of the church since Prop 1. Jack said something at Charlie's and, uh, Turning Point Faith Pastor Summit in Coronado in San Diego in August. And I did an Instagram Live with him, and I quoted it back to him. And I said, Jack, when you said that, people just lost it. And he said, you know what, I didn't plan to say that. I just, I don't know, I just, I just said it. I think it was the Lord. Here's what your pastor said in my earthly hero, Jack Hibbs. He said, if pastors and Christians can't preach against Prop 1 as California prepares to legalize abortion through point of birth and write it into the state constitution, you have abandoned your pulpit. You have walked away from your authority. Your mantle has fallen off. It's time for us to put a line in the sand and say, you will go no further than this line right here. And yet, we didn't. You did, but the Church of Jesus Christ in California and America did not. Michigan, Vermont, California, writing abortion through point of birth into their state constitution. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to Jeremiah 7.30. Jeremiah 7.30. Uh, for the wonderful media team, we don't, I didn't send it to you, just throw in a curveball, so don't worry. <laughs> so you actually have to open your Bibles. <laughs> Jeremiah 7.30, just a short section, I just want to read it briefly. For the sons of Judah have done evil in my sight, declares the Lord. They have set their detestable things in the house that is called by my name to defile it. And they have built the high places of Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it even enter my mind. Now, of course, God's omniscient, right? So it's, it's, he's using colorful language. He's not saying, oh, I didn't know you were going to do this. It's so detestable. It's so heinous that you would pass your children through the fire to Baal or to Moloch that I didn't even think my own people would come up with this. Therefore, behold, the days are coming when it will no longer be called Topheth or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. For they will bury in Topheth because there is no room elsewhere. And the dead bodies of this people will be food for the birds of the air and for the beasts of the earth, and none will frighten them away. And I will silence in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, for the land shall become a waste. You know, in Psalm 106, God tells the Israelites, you have sacrificed your sons and daughters to demons, and the land is desecrated with blood, a waste. And so, says the Lord in Psalm 106, I give you over to be ruled by those who hate you. Does it feel like the church has been being ruled by people who hate us in America and in California for some time now? Is it 
beyond the pale to ask the question, could it be because of our participation and intolerance of child sacrifice today? You see, God sees no distinction between killing babies outside the womb and killing them in the womb. We need to be very clear for all these wokey woke pastors and I'm not political Christian leaders who as my pastor Rob McCoy says, wait downstream to pick up human heartache that they helped create through their political apathy upstream. For all the pastors who say, I just preach where the Bible preaches and I'm silent where the Bible's silent and set the word abortion, it's not in scripture. So I, I'm a pastor, Seth. I, if it's not in here, I can't preach on it. In Luke 1, when it says the baby leaped in Elizabeth's womb, do you know the Greek word that is used to refer to baby John the Baptist, fetus John the Baptist, unborn John the Baptist. It's the Greek word berephos. Okay, turn to Luke 2, and it says, and Mary laid baby Jesus in the manger. So, oh, is, so is this unborn Jesus? No, obviously not. If she's laying baby Jesus in the manger, it's an infant. What Greek word? Do the authors of scripture use when they were written as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit to refer to Jesus already born? Berephos. Oh, God uses the same word to refer to a baby in the womb as a baby outside the womb. Oh, for pastors and Christians who would see no distinction in value, dignity, and worth between the baby in the womb and the baby outside the womb. Oh, but the Bible's not pro-life, Seth. Really? God couldn't be more clear about what he thinks about life in the womb and child sacrifice. And let me prove it to you. Um, he enters human history in a uterus to redeem mankind from their sins. Jesus identifies with you at your most vulnerable stage, the prenatal stage. So in Luke, uh, in Luke uh, 1, you've got the prenatal John the Baptist doing backflips in the womb as he recognizes his savior, the greatest prenatal deity to have ever existed who entered human history in the uterus to redeem mankind from their sins. But because Jesus is a second member of the Trinity and fully God and fully human from the moment of conception and because God knits life together in the womb, it means that the prenatal deity unborn fetal Jesus is knitting the prenatal John the Baptist together in the womb while he knits himself together in the womb because he is God, which means that he knits himself together in the womb of a woman whose uterus he once knit together when he knit together Mary in the womb of Mary's mother. <laughs> this is called the incarnation. So if you're ever bored or you need some more wonder in your faith, right? Just wake up every morning and dwell on that, right? We'll, we'll, we'll cut that as a reel on Instagram. You can watch it every morning when you wake up and roll out like drunk on the Holy Spirit, like, whoa. Right? I mean, these are beautiful truths. Jesus enters human history in a uterus to redeem mankind from their sins. So to be a pro-choice Christian or to vote for the party who slaughters children in the womb because you're personally pro-life, but you don't wanna, you don't wanna um, impose your Christian pro-life views on the broader culture is to commit a Christological heresy because that would maintain that Christ was at some point fully God, but not fully human. So your mantle has fallen off. You've walked away from your authority. And we need more Pastor Jack Hibbs and Rob McCoys in this season to give God a reason to show this country mercy. Brothers and sisters, we have two options before us in this culture war at this moment in California history. We have the, the choice of Lot or the choice of Gideon. I really believe that these are our two options now for the Church of Jesus Christ in America. You see, Lot and Gideon also faced their culture wars, <laughs> their political warfare. <laughs> and one of them was like Ed Stetzer, Rick Warren, Tim Keller, Andy Stanley, and the entire liberal establishment and Christian pastors who only speak as much truth as the spirit of the age allows them, lest they lose the ties of the Democrats who attend their church, whose political sensibilities they don't want to offend. <laughs> And the other option, the other option is to be about our father's high kingdom business and give him a reason to show America mercy. So I wanna tell you these two brief stories really quick. Where's Lot in Genesis when the angels come to torch San Francisco, uh, Sodom, <laughs> Sodom and Gomorrah? Where is Lot? He's at the city gates. So Lot was the Christian influencer of his day. 
Lot had a position of authority. You don't put someone at the city gates to welcome the foreigner into your land unless they have respect. He had political influence over the powers of the day. He was a Christian influencer. He probably had a great Instagram following. Life was pretty cush for him. But when the angels come to torch that city, it says what? Lot takes him to his house. And then what does it say? Men from all parts of the city. So from every part of culture comes down and descends on that one righteous man's house. You know, Bible calls Lot a righteous man. And then what do they say? Hey, Lot, bring those men out that we might have sex with them. It's like, wow, now you understand why God wanted to torch Sodom. <laughs> they weren't, well, first, they weren't men, they were angels. So it's like, yikes. And Lot comes out, and listen, Lot believed the truth. Lot was sometimes willing to speak the truth. But when it mattered, and when he needed to stand for the truth, he folds like a cheap suit. But he was willing to lob truth out there. What does he do? He goes out on his front porch and he says, brothers and sisters. So he tries to relate to the sexually obsessed mob. Hey, I'm a brother like you, right? right? Don't kill me, don't sleep with me. But he says, do not do this wicked or abominable thing. So he calls their actions wicked. He was willing to speak the truth. Oh boy, do we have a lot of Christian pastors and leaders and influencers and authors in America today who will say true things. They're willing to critique wokeness to a certain extent. But when they were needed to stand for what is closest to the heart of the father, little babies, the family, they also fold like a cheap suit. So what does Lot say? Here are my daughters. Have sex with them instead. You see, church, Lot was saved, but he wasn't salty. So his wife becomes in death what he should have been in life. A pillar of salt. You can be saved, but not salty, huh? You can make it into the kingdom by the hair on your bum. And you can say, ah, uh, by grace and grace alone. But what's gonna be your story at the marriage supper of the lamb? When Gina Gleason and Jack Hibbs and Charlie Kirk and Rob McCoy and all of the pastors who are like Ezekiel's in this season, and the pregnancy resource center directors, and the love life ministry here, and the sidewalk counselors, and those speaking at school board meetings, are saying, look what God did just because I was obedient. For obedience is better than sacrifice. Or do you wanna be like Lot and say, well, uh, um, I gave my daughters to uh, be raped by a mob, and God forgave me. The other option is the route of Gideon. And I'll give you some homework this afternoon. When you get home, go read Judges 6. In, in Judges 6, do you know where Gideon is? He's hiding out in a cave. Why is he hiding out in a cave? Because they had Bernie Sanders' democratic socialism. <laughs> no joke. No, it was democratic socialism, church. Okay, so it's better than normal socialism, I've, I've been told. Well, remember the Midianites were oppressing the Israelites? And so everything, they thresh their wheat and they make their food and the Midianites come and take it. So Gideon's like, forget this, I'm gonna go thresh my own wheat in a cave. So it's tax evasion, right? <laughs> so Gideon's evading the, you know, the, the taxes and God comes to Gideon in a cave in Judges 6 and he says, mighty man of valor. <laughs> calls him by his identity, calls him higher. Now what's Gideon thinking? <laughs> Where have you been? <laughs> Our grandpapas told us that you were the God that brought us up out of Egypt. That you would deliver us from the hand of the oppressor. Where's the milk and honey, yo? <laughs> Where's the promised land? This sucks. That's what Gideon's thinking. I thought theocracy. I thought save your people, God. <laughs> what? He, he cooks a meal for God. God lights it on fire, proves he's God. Gideon freaks out. He goes, oh, okay. And then it says, and that same night, so we're talking right after their little conversation. You want to know God's high kingdom priorities, huh? Judah and Chelsea Smith and Ed Stetzer and Lecrae and Jackie Hill Perry and every other Christian leader that only speaks as much truth as they can get away with without losing their platform and income. You want to know where God begins his high kingdom priorities? It says, and that same night, God told Gideon, walk out of this cave and you go tear down that altar to Baal, and you take that Asherah pole and you chop that up too. 
then we'll talk. Well, who was Baal, church? The god of baby sacrifice. And who was Asherah? The goddess of sex. And they would worship Asherah through orgies and unbridled sexual escapades, which nine months later results in an unwanted baby, (laughs) which you then pass through the fire to Baal. What if I told you the strategy has never changed? What if I told you there's nothing new under the sun? And as it was in Judges 6, so it is today. Planned Parenthood and the spirit of the age and his acolytes have used the same Judges 6 strategy for decades. They push pornographic, sexually titillating material and curriculum onto young kids to break down their sexual and societal mores and standards to reduce them to their most animalistic appetites so they can't govern themselves, so they'll have more sex, so that more unwanted babies will be produced, which you can then pass through the fires to Planned Parenthood today. Gideon is facing the same culture war that we're facing today that so many pastors refuse to engage on because they, I don't really do the culture war, I just preach the gospel. No, you preach a syncretist, cheap grace gospel to ensure that you don't lose any tithes from the people in your congregation who you refuse to call to repentance. God begins with the Israelites' abortions before he begins with anything else. You go tear down that altar of baby sacrifice. How about that? How about then we'll have a conversation? Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. I'm about to share some things with you that most churches in this country have never heard before. Most Christian schools have never heard before. We do not understand the strategy of the enemy, nor the people that the enemy of our souls has used to advance his ideology. G.K. Chesterton once said, happy is he who knows not only the hidden causes of things, but who has not lost touch with their beginnings. I know it's a little early for Chesterton. I mean, Chesterton was like, you know. Let me say that again. (laughs) Happy is he who knows not only the hidden causes of things, but who has not lost touch with their beginnings. In other words, happy is he who knows how we got here, who can return to those ancient pagan demonic ideas that were planted in the cultural soil by political elites and the high priests of secular progressivism that contended through their long walk through the institutions to put their ideas, their worldview, and the people who would advocate for those ideas in the public square, in political seats, in positions of influence, while we stood by the sidelines and said, I'm not political. And then we launch our 501c3s and our ministries of mercy to care for the broken people whose heartache we could have prevented if we had been contending upstream from once these ideas come. That's what G.K. Chesterton is saying, but we do not understand the strategy of the enemy. We do not understand how Judges 6 has become the cultural linchpin of the Marxist revolution in America today. We've been fulfilling G.K. Chesterton's prophetic warning when he said, unless a man becomes the enemy of an evil, he will not even become its slave, but rather its champion. I know, I know, Mm, you have to chew on that one a little bit. Unless a man becomes the enemy of that evil over there, he won't even become the slave of the evil that he tolerates, he will turn into its champion. There's no such thing as moral neutrality. If you stand in the middle of the road, you'll get run over by a truck. So, how did we get here? For goodness sakes. Who could have predicted the cultural climate in America in 2022 right now when I was born in 1991? You know all the the slippery slope conservatives, right? Like with with Obergefell, you know, that there's a right to gay marriage or something. They were like, uh, we were like, uh, next thing you're gonna try to do like thruples and polyamorous unions, and you'll wanna call that marriage. And they're pushing for it right now. In the sexual revolution, we were like, if you start inculcating the society and propagandizing birth control, next thing you know, it'll be abortions. Next thing you know, it'll be no-fault divorce. And all of the political elites smeared the conservatives with our slippery slope argument. Oh, you stupid tinfoil hat conspiracy theorists. Where is the bottom of this slippery slope? You could not have predicted the culture in America right now when I was born in 1991. How did we get here? Much of the cultural and societal rot we're experiencing is due to one of the patron saints of feminism. 
Her name is Margaret Sanger, the founder of the American Birth Control League, later renamed Planned Parenthood. So if we're going to understand how we got here, we need to return to those early cultural and political revolutionaries who had a more robust liturgy and religion than most Christians did. Of course, it was not pure and undefiled religion, but it was a religion, and it had creeds, and it had a sacrament, and it had liturgies, and they were more dogmatic about their religion than most Christians are for ours. In the early 1900s, Margaret Sanger begins to be radicalized by actual communists and socialists in the New York labor movement in the early 1900s. This is where Margaret Sanger, the patron saint of feminism, gets her beginning. And you need to understand who this woman is if we're to understand why Prop 1 happened, if we're to understand why pro-life OBGYNs are now being told, if you won't perform an abortions, we're gonna sue you for pregnancy discrimination. If, we, if you want to understand why Corrine Jean-Pierre, who replaced Circle Back Saki and the White House press secretary, is labeling Christians, pro-lifes, and conservatives as domestic terrorists and the greatest and most extreme threat to freedom and democracy, if you want to know why the FBI has arrested over 11 pro-lifers in the last six weeks for breaking no laws, but because they're a pain in the butt, a stick in the eye, and a fly in the ointment to the liberal establishment, which is built on the mutilated bodies of 65 million children, if you want to understand all of this, we have to go to Margaret Sanger and all of her friends and influences in the culture wars, which was really just a proxy war for the deeper spiritual war. So, Sanger believed that if you wanted to revolutionize society, you had to break down healthy standards and norms. She understood that you couldn't usher in the Marxist revolution, the social revolution, unless you started with the sexual revolution. Do you follow me? Because sex is so fundament fundamental to who man and woman is. It's what C.S. Lewis said, the head rules the belly through the chest. So the abolition of man is men without chests. The head is the intellect, the belly is the animal, the chest is virtue, honor, and morality. Men without chests means that the head rules the belly with nothing to temper it in between. And are human beings good at rationalizing their sinful decisions and justifying it up in their mind? Yes, remove the chest, you can do anything you wanna do. Margaret Sanger's goal was to create men without chess, to usher in relativism and sexually titillating material, to break down those healthy societal norms and standards so people couldn't govern themselves and they'd be a sucker for the first would-be tyrant and his utopian promises that rises among them. Do you understand now? So she begins to write and encourage sexual chaos and birth control which convinced Americans that consent to sex is not consent to pregnancy, that we can separate those things. And so if I'm on birth control, then I didn't consent to pregnancy, so therefore I have the right to abort the child because I didn't consent to this baby. So in 1914, Margaret Sanger writes her first published materials. This is where we start to see her ideas in a published public format for the first time. And her first paper was called Woman Rebel. Woman Rebel with the tagline, no gods and no masters. Oh, oh, so, oh okay, so, so the Garden of Eden. So the first lie. Eat the apple, get woke, God's holding out on you. If you eat the apple, your eyes will be opened because God's keeping them closed because he hates you, he's not showing you true reality. And then if you eat the apple, ye shall be as gods. Oh, no gods and no masters, I'm my own God. This is where Margaret Sanger gets her beginning. Here's what she said. Rebel women claim the following rights. The right to be lazy, oh yes. I forgot to insert laugh track. If you think we made her look like a demon now, just wait in a few minutes. Rebel women claim the following rights, the right to be lazy, the right to be an unmarried mother, the right to destroy, and the right to love. Her publications on sexual liberation, the social revolution, um, and she even defended the need for political assassinations, eventually got her indicted on three counts for breaking the Comstock laws in New York, which prevented you from sending this kind of pornographic titillating material through the Postal Service. And it gave the Postal Service the right to go through the mail and remo remove such material. So rather than being arrested, guess what Sanger does? This is where she gets her beginning, you ready? She ships her kids off to be raised by someone else. She has her socialist friends in the New York labor movement forge her a passport and she flees to England. This is where the founder of Planned Parenthood gets her beginning. She gets more radicalized by the people she meets in England than she was in New York. And she meets the Neo-Malthusians. The Neo-Malthusians. Okay, what is it? what's that? Malthusian, Thomas Malthus. 
Malthusianism. Okay, so who was Thomas Malthus? If, if, if she met his disciples and was influenced by their ideas before she would come back to New York and open up her first illegal, illegal birth control clinic, then who, what was Malthusianism? Well, here's Thomas Malthus. Um, he was an early 19th century Anthony Fauci. <laughs> Don't worry, guys. He was just following the science. Yeah, he was a public health student, he's a scientist, just, you know, just explaining the science and the data and everything. Um, except he just really hated, I don't know, Jews, Slavs, Italians, and blacks. Oh, and the poor and the mentally and physically unfit. And so Thomas Malthus believed that food production can't keep up with population growth, with the inevitable result being massive starvation. Anyone notice the liberal establishment's obsession with overpopulation today? Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg. George Soros, the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, the entire Democrat Party, who peddle, we have too many people. By the way, ever heard of the book, The Population Bomb? Written in 1964 by Paul Ehrlich. Paul Ehrlich was a board member for Planned Parenthood. Hmm. And he was repeating the same Thomas Malthus ideas from the early 1800s. So here's a little bit of what Thomas Malthus believed. Okay, you ready? This is from his magnum opus, an essay on the principle of population. All children born beyond what would be required to keep up the population to a desired level must necessarily perish, unless room be made for them by the deaths of grown persons. So we should facilitate, instead of foolishly and vainly endeavoring to impede the operations of nature in producing this mortality. And if we dread the too frequent visitation of the horrid form of famine, we should encourage the other forms of destruction which we compel nature to use. Instead of recommending cleanliness to the poor, we should encourage contrary habits. In our towns, we should make the streets more narrow. We should crowd more people into the houses to court the return of the plague. In the country, we should build our villages near stagnant pools and particularly encourage settlements in all marshy and unwholesome situations. But above all, <laughs> we should reprobate specific remedies for ravaging diseases and restrain those benevolent but much mistaken men who thought they were doing a service to mankind by projecting schemes for the total extirpation of particular disorders. Okay, can I summarize that for you? Some people are good and some people are bad. We need more of the good people and less of the bad people. The bad people have bad genes and eugenics means good in birth, which means some people are good in birth and some people are bad in birth. And so there are certain genes that we just don't really want reproducing through the gene pool. So if you have like a, a mental disability or a physical disability, or if you're like a Jew, a Slav, an Italian, or a black, and people we don't really want having more kids, then we need to encourage um, we need to encourage the destruction of those people and make sure that they're sterilized so they can't have more kids. This is where much of the overpopulation obs obsession by leftist theocrats actually begins. And these are the people that Margaret Sanger meets in her exile in England. Then she meets a man named Havelock Ellis. Okay, so remember my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. I I'm trying to explain to you how the religious priests of humanism were more devoted to their religion than we were to ours. So then she meets a man named Havelock Ellis. Who's ever heard of Alfred Kinsey? Love that, love that. Uh, not enough people, I'll talk to Jack about that, that's okay. Um, <laughs> Alfred Kinsey was a pornographic, sexually degenerate, obsessed demon. Um, who, who started the Kinsey Institute at Indiana University, which is still there. By the way, Indiana University just erected a new statue in the last two months to honor Alfred Kinsey on their campus. Uh, he, he interviewed pedophiles in jail who had raped children between 12 months old and seven years old and documented their rape in charts and timed their orgasms, and he published this material. This is, okay, I can't really go beyond that. That's Alfred Kinsey. Well, Havelock Ellis was the English alternative to Alfred Kinsey. Havelock Ellis wrote over 50 books on every form of sexually lewd, titillating material. He himself was impotent, so he was always trying to find new ways to get excited. That's the PG-13 version. So he meets Margaret Sanger. By the way, Margaret Sanger sleeps her way up the levers of power in England. She slept with H.G. Wells, uh, Havelock Ellis, and many others. Havelock Ellis said, hey, Sanger, your, 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 your rhetoric's a little too radical, but listen, I believe it too. I want you to be successful, but you need to tone down the more radical sounding themes of communism and anarchism, and you need to focus on the more scientific sounding themes of eugenics and Malthusianism. So she, he becomes a mentor to Havelock Ellis. Okay, Havelock Ellis had a mentor named Francis Galton. Francis Galton coined the term eugenics. Francis Galton invents the term <laughs> eugenics. Some people are good and some people are bad, so we need to encourage more good people to have kids and the bad people not to have kids. Okay, Francis Galton, you see, mentored Havelock Ellis. Guess who Francis Galton's half-cousin was? Charles Darwin. 
right. Survival of the fittest. We're no more valuable than animals. PETA's vision is true. We don't have any more dignity than the, co the cow, the dog, or the cat. There is no sanctity of life. There is no human exceptionalism. Therefore, the strong will survive and the weak will die. Might makes right in the religion of humanism. Francis Schaeffer once said that humanism is the placing of man at the center of all things and making him the measure of all things. In other words, ye shall be as gods, <laughs> okay? So you've got Charles Darwin, whose ideology is responsible for more bloodshed in the 20th century than in all of world history combined before that, whose cousin Francis Galton modernizes the eugenics movement, who mentors Havelock Ellis, who becomes the number one mentor to Margaret Sanger before she goes back to New York to open up her first illegal birth control clinics. Hey, maybe the culture war was just a proxy war for the spiritual war. And by the way, they're still obsessed with this idea of overpopulation, right? You had to kill the babies, right? This is why Bernie Sanders, two years ago, at the climate catastrophe town hall, wait, said, one of the solutions to, climate, to fighting climate change is to fund abortions in poor black countries. Bernie Sanders said this on national television. I'll never forget it. I covered it in my podcast. By the way, my podcast is called Unaborted with Seth Gruber because we're all unaborted. So, uh, you know, pull out your phone, subscribe, leave us five stars, you know, help, you know, I'll pull the Charlie Kirk strategy here, you know, it actually helps us beat a ton of people and the show shows up everywhere. Um, so, Bernie Sanders says, okay, so, uh, yeah, we have too many people, right? Malthusianism, there's not enough resources to keep up with population growth. But by the way, have you ever noticed how these, these communist degenerates like Bernie Sanders never volunteer to suicide themselves? <laughs> it's the same thing with all the people who peddle climate change lies who fly on private, uh, private jets everywhere. It's like, you obviously don't believe what you're saying. If we have so many people and you believe some people need to be killed, why don't you start with yourself? But it's always poorer and blacker people and darker of skin. It's a fascinating aspect of progressivism today. So <laughs> he says, yeah, it's too many people, so we gotta kill the babies, right? How is this any different than the Aztecs in 1484, right before Columbus shows up, who at the Temple Mayor at Tenochtitlan ritually sacrificed thousands of people over a three-day period, and they would take knives and slice the chest of their victims open, yank out the heart, and, and hold it up to their sun god, Huitzilopochtli. By the way, the other Aztec sun god was named Tizlatopoca, and we have California legislation in our public schools where public high school students were required to chant Aztec chants to Tizlatopoca. And I actually have a video of this of a public high school in California whose public school teachers were leading Aztec chants to Tizlatopoca. Topoka for social justice warrior chants. So once again, hey, maybe this was always just a spiritual war <laughs> that masqueraded as just the politics to keep the politically impotent pastors silent. Anyways, I digress. So how is this any different than them? Because they believe Witzelopochtli, their sun god, listen to this, was fighting a constant war against darkness. And if Witzelopochtli ever lost that war against darkness, then the sun would stop moving across the sky. And it, the world would be plunged into a cold, cold darkness, and everyone would die. This is what the Aztecs believe. So they, they believe, oh, humans, we have to sacrifice humans to, to Huitzilopochtli to satiate him and, and fund his war against darkness. How is that any different than Bernie Sanders and the entire liberal establishment today who says the sun god's really angry with us and overpopulation is harming the environment, which is causing climate change. And if we don't significantly curb overpopulation, the sun will cease to shine and move across the sky. The world will be plunged into a cold, cold darkness and everyone will die. <laughs> They're still pushing human sacrifice to pagan deities today with the same belief. So this is who Margaret Sanger's best friends were, wow. She returns to America, she opens up her illegal birth control clinic and begins to propagandize birth control in black enclaves in New York City. Right. She launches her birth control league and she launches her American birth control review, her publication, where she shares her ideas and the ideas of her friends all around the world who were part of the eugenics movement. Sanger actually coined the term birth control. Kind of interesting. Now, I'm not here today to do an entire sermon on birth control. I actually respect the Catholic position against birth control. Come, come talk to me about it afterwards. But I just want you to know, isn't that kind of interesting? The woman who coins the term birth control wanted to use it to prevent people she didn't like from reproducing. Here's what she said. Eugenics without birth control seems to us a house built upon the sands. It is at the mercy of the rising streams of the unfit. Don't forget that word, by the way, okay? Unfit. It's, it's the, probably the central most important word in the ideology of eugenics because some people are unfit to live. 
and some people are fit to live. And usually it's rich white people and people with good genes, believe Margaret Sanger. So she tried to merge the American Birth Control League with major eugenics organizations on two different occasions. By the way, the American Birth Control League had their offices in the same office space as the American Eugenics Society. So Sanger's like heading into work, sipping lattes, hanging out with the founders and presidents of the American Eugenics Society. <laughs> so this is what this movement was wrapped up in. Ideas have consequences, huh? And bad ideas have victims. So she publishes her first book, The Pivot of Civilization, in 1922, and Sanger wrote about how she longed, she longed for when the choking human undergrowth of morons and imbeciles would be segregated and sterilized, end quote. Segregated and sterilized. Her great inspiration was this, to create a race of thoroughbreds by encouraging more children from the fit and less from the unfit. I told you that word was important. Some people aren't fit to live, and we shall be as gods. <laughs> so we get to decide who has value and who should have a right to life and who shouldn't. As she put it at a 1921 International Eugenics Congress in New York City, quote, the most urgent problem today is how to limit the overfertility of the mentally and physically defective. <laughs> okay. And then in 1925, she starts hosting conferences eugenics conferences and inviting people from all around the world to share their ideas on eugenics. Guys, 100 years ago, following the science just meant being a eugenicist. You need to understand this. Eugenics was, was accepted as the scientific norm 100 years ago, and those laws were dominating much of American states' laws as well that mandated sterilizations for those deemed unfit to live. So here's what Sanger said. The government of the United States deliberately encourages and even makes necessary by its laws the breeding with a breakneck rapidity of idiots, defectives, diseased, feeble-minded, and criminal classes. Billions of dollars are expensed by our state and federal governments and by private charities and philanthropies for the care the maintenance and the perpetuation of these classes, year by year, more money is expensed to maintain an increasing race of morons, which threatens the very foundation of our civilization. And then at the 1925 Sanger Birth Control Conference, they would say, it's the dullard, it's the gawk, the numbskull, the simpleton, the weakling, and the scatterbrain are amongst us. Intermarrying? Breeding? Inordinately prolific, literally threatening to overwhelm the world with their useless and terrifying get. Wow. Now, remember that Malthusian ethic that said, we need to stop the charities and the ministries of mercy because they're actually preventing the poor and the defectives from you know, just expiring into human oblivion. We don't want those people having kids. Sanger would repeat that same Neo-Malthusian line because she was influenced by the same people and she would go after 501c3s and private charities. Here you go, here's Sanger. Organized charity is the symptom of a malignant social disease. You know, those vast, complex, interrelated organizations aiming to control and to diminish the spread of misery and destitution? Those ministries are the surest sign that our civilization has bred, is breeding, and is perpetuating constantly increasing numbers of defectives, delinquents, and dependents. My criticism, therefore, is not directed at the failure of philanthropy, but rather at its success. <laughs> These dangers inherent in the very idea of humanitarianism and altruism, dangers which have today produced their full harvest of human waste. Now you see why we made her look like a demon, huh? All right, pastors, do we have any barf bags? Do we need to distribute any? Is everyone okay? Are you following with me? Okay. All right, ready for the racism? As if it's not bad enough? Well, in 1939, Margaret Sanger launches the Negro Project. Yeah, that's what she called it. Now, why would you call it that, church? Don't worry, she's not a racist. She was just a woman of her times. I'm sure that calling her project the Negro Project had nothing to do with her deeper eugenic racist ideals. The proposal asserted the following. You ready? Here's where she starts. The mass of Negroes, particularly in the South, still breed carelessly and disastrously, with the result that the increase among Negroes, even more than among whites, is from that portion of the population least intelligent and 
fit. <laughs> wow. Okay, so if that was the problem, what was the solution? Ready? You, you can go Reuters, fact check me, Washington Post, five Pinocchios. You can fact check all this stuff, all right? Here's the goal of the Negro Project. The gradual suppression, elimination, and eventual extinction of defective stocks, those human weeds, which threaten the blossoming of the finest flowers of American civilization. Defective stocks, human, hu oh, hu right, human weeds, because they're not fit to live. Black, Slavs, Italians, Jews, mentally and physically defective, those with bad genes. So guess what she said? Well, we need to get colored people to propagandize our message and actually run it so that the black people we're targeting for extermination will be less suspicious of our deeper agenda because it will be run by people who look like them. What if I told you the strategy is the same today? With Planned Parenthood, it has 79% of their surgical abortion facilities within walking distance of majority black neighborhoods, and then they will only hire black people at the front desk of those Planned Parenthoods in black enclaves so that the black babies who dwell in the wombs of their mothers who are walking in will be less suspicious when they see someone who looks like them. So she wrote a letter to Dr. Clarence Gamble. This is probably the one you're familiar with. It's the most famous. We propose to hire three or four colored ministers preferably with social service backgrounds and with engaging personalities. The most successful educational approach to the Negro is through a religious appeal. Because we do not want word to get out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. And the black minister, he's the one who can straighten out that idea if it occurs to any more of his rebellious members. <laughs> Hey, 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 black pastors. Hey, black pastors of major charismatic black-run churches in America. Hey, can you just like peddle Democrat party lies about birth control and abortion so that you continue to vote for the very party that wants to lynch you in the womb and exterminate you? Because then we'll be more effective because people will feel more comfortable because they won't think that someone who looks like them would be helping lead a campaign to exterminate them. How is that any different today than in the major, uh, sadly and tragically, the majority of all black churches in America today are tools for the Democrat Party campaign, which was built by Margaret Sanger's vision, which is alive and welcome, and not just in the halls of academia, but in, in the churches today. So guess what Sanger does? Well, we gotta hire Negro project directors. I can't do this by myself, I need help. So she raised up regional coordinators, Negro project directors at the community level and we have some of their writings. Is everyone awake? Are y'all following me? Do we need any Americanos or lattes distributed? Okay, here you go, ready for this? If you haven't barfed yet, get ready. Here is what a Negro Project director said. There is a great danger that we will fail because the Negroes think that this is a plan for their extermination. So, so, let's appear to let the colored run it. <laughs> Everything I just told you about, unfortunately, black charismatic Christian leaders that prop up the genocidal agenda against black people, that was being planned by Negro Project directors in the 1930s. Hey, let's just make them think they run it. Here was another Negro Project director. I wonder if Southern darkies can ever be entrusted with a clinic. Now wait, who calls black people Southern darkies? <laughs> Racist. I wonder if Southern darkies can ever be entrusted with a clinic because our experience causes us to doubt their ability to work. Well, of course, except under white supervision. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret Sanger's priests, her pontiffs of the religion of humanism, would seek to upend society and recreate it in their own image. The entire operation was a ruse. It was a manipulative attempt to get blacks to cooperate in their own elimination. And that project was largely successful. As my friend Dr. George Grant says, its genocidal intentions were carefully camouflaged beneath several layers of condescending social service rhetoric and organizational expertise. In other words, follow the science. Margaret's dream was being fulfilled, church. And here's how she put it in her book. Discouraging the defective and diseased elements of humanity from their reckless, an irresponsible swarming and spawning. The ultimate assault against the Imago Dei and those created in the image of God. But where was the church? Oh, we, we weren't political, praise God. Sanger had some friends, 
I'll do this quickly. Lothrop Stoddard, a board member of the American Birth Control League, later renamed Planned Parenthood. Here's something about Lothrop Stoddard. He wrote a book called The Rising Tide of Color Against White World Supremacy. That was the title of his book. He sat on her board. Oh, he was a high official of the Massachusetts Ku Klux Klan. Oh, so that's nice. Then he wrote a book called The Rise of the Underman. Oh, who's, who's the underman, guys? Uh, blacks and Jews. And then Adolf Hitler's chief racial theorist, Alfred Rosenberg. Oh, we got some woke informed Christians in there. Okay? They're like, I know him. Alfred Rosenberg appropriates the English version of his book to the German term Untermensch. Untermensch also means subhuman and was the title of Heinrich Himmler's famous Nazi propaganda book. Guys, the Nazis got the term Untermensch from the English version of Margaret Sanger's board member's book. And then so Lothrop Stoddard goes on a journalistic tour in Germany in the early 40s, and he interviews Himmler, and he interviews Hitler, and was given great journalistic preferential treatment because the Nazis knew that he was on the same team. He was once called one of the spiritual fathers of Nazi Germany. That was from Hans Gunther, a race anthropologist in Germany who referred to Lothrop Stoddard as one of the spiritual fathers of Nazi Germany. Then there was Leon Whitney, the executive secretary of the American Eugenics Society, who remember shared office spaces with the American Birth Control League? <laughs> so Leon Whitney would write in Sanger's Review, where she published her ideas. He wrote a piece called Selective Sterilization. Selective sterilization, right? Because not everyone should be sterilized, just the unfit, right? And in that piece, he praised and defended the Third Reich's pre-Holocaust race purification programs. Now, did, did you just get a write in Sanger's Review whenever you wanted? No, you had to be invited to write. Who invited him to write? Margaret Sanger. Then Leon Whitney's friend, Madison Grant, was a leader of the American Eugenic Society. Madison Grant. Madison Grant once put a black man in a cage with a monkey at the New York City Bronx Zoo to, quote, illustrate evolution. Here's what Madison Grant wrote in his book, The Passing of the Great Race, in 1916. Here's Madison Grant, one of Sanger's allies. Mistaken regard for what are believed to be divine laws and your sentimental belief in the sanctity of human life. Those beliefs tend to prevent both the elimination of defective infants and the sterilization of such adults who are of themselves of no value to the community. The laws of nature require the obliteration of the unfit and human life is only valuable when it is of use to the community or race. Madison Grant. Then Madison Grant, that guy, he got a letter in the mail one day from a German corporal recently out of prison and rising in the German political scene. And he called Madison Grant's book his Bible. And he takes the letter to Leon Whitney the guy who wrote the selective sterilization piece that praised the Third Reich's pre-Holocaust race purification programs, and he says, hey, Leon, <laughs> our writings are influencing the Germans. Leon Whitney smiles and chuckles and pulls out his own letter he had just received from the same German corporal, recently out of prison and rising in the German political scene. And they start celebrating that their American eugenics ideas are influencing the Germans. The man who wrote those letters was named... Adolf Hitler. Wow. Hmm. Then there was Ernst Rudin, who wrote a piece in Sanger's Review called Eugenic Sterilization, an Urgent Need. And in that book, he praises the Nazi eugenics legislation laws. And guess who Ernst Rudin was at this time writing for Margaret Sanger? None other than Hitler's director of genetic sterilization. Okay, wow, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. 100 years ago, following the science meant being a eugenicist. In America, from Harvard to Princeton to Nobel Prize winning scientists to the American Museum of Natural History to Supreme Court justices, 
Eugenics was believed to just be the inevitable arc of the moral universe bending towards justice and peace. So much so that Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, who's heard that name? Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes in the 1927 court opinion, Buck versus Bell, that was an 8-1 decision, 8-1 that upheld Virginia's mandated sterilization laws of those deemed unfit to reproduce. Here's how Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes in America in 1927 summed up the science of his day. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. So you need to understand this was not just a Germany thing. You understand that? We had sterilization eugenics laws in America. Within 10 years, you had laws mandating the sterilization of those considered a threat to the gene pool. Alcoholics, criminals, immigrants, and African Americans passed in 32 different states in America. And it's estimated that at least 70,000 people were forcibly sterilized from California to New York. Now, lest you think I'm jesting, Henry Osborne, a paleontologist and the co-founder of the American Eugenics Society, okay? Henry Osborne, so he, was a paleo so he loved the dinosaurs, but he hated humans. Yeah, welcome to secular progressivism today where they love animals more than people. Do you see, this, this is not new, this is very old. Here's what he said. As science has enlightened the government in the prevention and spread of disease, it must also enlighten government in the prevention of the spread and multiplication of worthless members of society. Hillary Clinton would call those deplorables and irredeemables. Joe Biden and Corrine Jean-Pierre would call that domestic terrorists and the greatest and most extreme threat to freedom and democracy. Do you see that we're living through the next iteration of the eugenics ideas that these secular progressive priests were planting into the soil of the republic for decades? It was the unborn, and now it's anyone who would stand against the killing of those children. Why is this? Because abortion is the sacrament of the religion of secular progressivism. You need to understand this. Pastors who refuse to engage this issue are actually refusing to preach against false religion because abortion says, you must die so I can live. But Christ says, no, I must die so you can live. I die and I'm killed and I raise from death so you can too. So repent and believe you will be saved and be used to accomplish miracles on this world and earth. Peter Kreft, the Catholic philosopher, put it better than I've heard any Protestant ever put it, when he said abortion is the demonic parody of the Eucharist. That's why it uses the same holy words. This is my body. But with the opposite, blasphemous meaning. So what does Christ say in the upper room? at the Last Supper and the First Communion, this is my body, and I, I break it for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. What if I told you it's not ironic and it's not a coincidence that the central phrase that is the linchpin of the entire secular progressive project are the words, this is my body, my choice and I'll kill whatever's inside of my body because the serpent told me in Genesis 3, ye shall be as gods. And a god gets to decide who lives and who dies. But a god also gets to live forever, right? That's what makes a god a god, they're eternal. This is why we kill babies through embryonic stem cell research, fetal organ harvesting, and most recently, prenatal gene editing. They're doing this in America right now. They're trying to edit the genes of little babies conceived in test tubes and grow them past 14 days in the lab so that if they can perfect gene editing and kill the little babies in doing so, they can apply it on adults when it's safe, of course, because we don't want to compromise our own rights and health, and we can edit out of our gene code certain susceptibilities to diseases and disorders so we can live just a little bit longer. Abortion is the pagan replacement for man's pursuit of eternal life. Rather than accepting the broken body and shed blood of Christ for eternal life. They demand that we break the bodies and shed the blood of babies for eternal life. You know, if, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 26 says, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Man is fundamentally a religious being. You displace Christianity and weird, kooky other pagan religions will enter its place. And Margaret Sanger understood this. That's why she wanted to use the sexual revolution to usher in the social revolution and displace Christianity as the dominant worldview in America. The only man to see all of this 
in the early 1900s from an unprecedented, prescient playing field and prophetic vision was a man named G.K. Chesterton. I call him the first lib-triggering troll. <laughs> Truly, before Trump, even before Reagan, G.K. Chesterton knew how to troll the left in their ideas, make a public spectacle of them, make their ideas a laughingstock, but shame on the churches in America. In the early 1920s, when Margaret Sanger was beginning her religious vision, that the only man who would see that and warn and warn and say, do you see where this is going, was one man. And today he's credited as one of the only people to be publicly outspoken against these things. Chesterton once said, if Darwinism was the doctrine of the survival of the fittest, then eugenics was the doctrine of the survival of the nastiest. <laughs> So Chestertonian, because who's alive behind the project and aims of eugenics? Some of the nastiest people you could possibly imagine. The kind of people who look at it like Nick Vujicic and say, oh, I don't want him to have kids. Oh, he doesn't have any limbs. The kind of people who look at Down syndrome children and adults and say, they should not be allowed to reproduce. We don't want any more of them. The people who look at blacks, Jews, Italians, and Slavs, the poor, the mentally defective, the alcoholics, the criminal class, and say, oh, it would be better for all of us if they didn't exist. And Chesterton saw it all. He referred to the eugenicists of his day the way we should refer to the eugenicists of our day when he said, they combine a hardening of the heart with a sympathetic softening of the head. Because <laughs> these ideas are stupid, they are ridicule worthy, but they will contend for those ideas nonetheless. And you will be the next iteration of those deemed unfit to live until you stand in the middle of the road of the culture of death with a big sign that says, stop and be like a Gideon instead of a lot. We are in a late hour of this American culture war. You do not label your political opponents domestic terrorists unless you seek to see them treated as such. And if you dare be like Gideon and stand against the sacrament of Satan and the secular progressive religion, you will also be defined as unfit to live. So you need to understand abortion is not detached from the secular progressive moral revolution. It actually plays the central role in the entire Marxist revolutionary takeover. So when people say, Seth, I love your pro-life heart and calling, but I'm called to other battlefronts. By the way, praise God, I would never tell you to abandon a calling God put on your life to become a full-time pro-life activist, though God may be calling some of you to become full-time love life missionaries at this church, to tear down the high places of Moloch in California. But if you're not called to that full-time, that's okay, but you can't neglect this battlefront because it plays the, the central role. It's actually the linchpin upon which secular progressivism swings. And if you remove that linchpin, the entire liberal establishment begins to collapse in on itself like a dying star. Which is why when Roe v. Wade got overturned on June 24th, 2022, all of the CNN and activist media headlines, by the way, I call them journalistic prostitutes for the culture of death, all of their chirons and headlines were like, the GOP is coming for all of our rights. They were saying things like, without abortion, they're gonna come for everything else. It was very interesting. It was one of the most important lessons for the church right after the overturning of Roe was to watch the headlines and commentary from Moloch Serviles. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, political pundits on the left. <laughs> Freudian slip. So when you say one thing and mean your mother. What they were telling us is they were saying, without abortion, we don't know what to do anymore. Right. Mm. It's not just one feature of progressivism. It is the sacrament, the centerpiece, and the linchpin. And when we refuse to be like Gideon, we should not complain and whine when one day we're defined as the next iteration of those deemed unfit to live. With almost unparalleled political vision, Chesterton wrote in 1920, listen, listen, church, this is one year before Sanger launches her American Birth Control League. One year before she launches the organization. And Chesterton proved how he saw it all. We are not so very far off from even the sacrifice of babies. If not to a crocodile, at least to a creed. The creed of eugenics, the creed of Darwinism, 
The creed of neo-Malthusianism, the creed of overpopulationism. Some people are good and some people are bad, so we will position ourselves as the high priests of humanism and decide who lives and who dies. 1920, he writes that in a newspaper in England. Where was the church? What if we had heeded the warnings of G.K. Chesterton, amen? What if the church had cared more about righteousness and the plight of their neighbors than their own comfort and reputation? What if God's people had awakened and realized that the culture war, it was a proxy war. It was a proxy war for the deeper spiritual war, but we buried that evil. We convinced ourselves that Christianity had nothing to do with politics. We were like Lot and we wanted a place at the table. We didn't want to be reviled. We wanted to make Christianity in a Rick Warren attractive model. Oops, I just said that publicly. <laughs> We wanted it to be really attractive and not offend the political sensibilities of Christians who need to be called to repentance for supporting the party that's fulfilling Margaret Sanger's vision of slaughtering 65 million image bearers in the womb. So we buried that evil. But in burying that evil that was plainly before us, we implanted it. Which is why Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the survivor of the Russian gulags, and one of the most prophetic voices in the 20th century would famously write, in keeping silent about evil and burying it so deep within us that no sign of it appears on the surface, we were actually implanting it. And it would then rise up a thousandfold in the future. And boy, did the ideology of eugenics rise up a thousandfold in the future, thanks to the silence of Christians and the commitment of follow the science, Anthony Fauci, Thomas Malthus revolutionaries, tens of millions, tens of millions of people were murdered in the 20th century or forcibly sterilized because of the ideology of eugenics, because of Margaret Sanger's political vision, because of Charles Darwin, because of Francis Galton, because of Lothrop Stoddard, because of Madison Grant, because of Leon Whitney, because of Antonio Gramsci, because of the high priests of secular progressivism that were more dogmatic about their religion than the Christians were about theirs. We need Christian resistance in this late hour of the American culture war. It's time to stop blaming the doers of evil and start blowing the trumpet, engaging and resisting the spirit of the age and his obsession with killing babies. And so I wanna tell you a short story, a very short story as we close our time together this evening about Christian resistance and about a couple of young people who, guess what? We're contending against the same Margaret Sanger vision in the 1940s that we are today. The iteration of eugenics then was the Jews. The iteration of eugenics now is the babies, and the next iteration is soon to be you. Which is why Dr. Mildred Jefferson, the woman who turned Ronald Reagan pro-life, famously said, today it is the unborn child. Tomorrow it is likely to be the elderly, or those who are incurably ill. Who knows? But then a little later, it might be anyone who has political and moral views that do not fit into the new distorted order. Well, a young woman named Sophie Scholl understood this. And at 21 years old in Munich, Germany in 1942, she was horrified at the atrocities being committed against her Jewish neighbors. Her father spent some time in jail for publicly criticizing Hitler. She came from a robust Christian family. She loved the Lord. We have the letters to prove it. And in 1942, she's walking the sidewalks of Munich and she picks up a paper that's on the road and it says, Leaflets of the White Rose. And she starts reading this leaflet and it's explicitly condemning the crimes of the Nazis and asking the good people to wake up. They said things like, we are the White Rose resistance. We are your bad conscience and we will not leave you alone. They said things like, if you know, why do you not act? Sophie at 21 understood, stop blaming evil people for doing evil things, for goodness sake. Be a student of history. That's what they always do. Your responsibility is to stand in the middle of the road and prevent their agenda. It says, Reagan said, evil is powerless if the good are unafraid. And Sophie understood this. So she demands to join the White Rose Resistance. Guys, this is 1942. Jews have been wearing the yellow star for about three years. They're being rounded up and burned in concentration camps already and their ashes are falling on the steeples of local churches who Bonhoeffer called cheap grace Christians who would only preach as much truth as the spirit of the age allowed them. 1942, folks. 
So Sophie says, I want to join the White Rose Resistance. Come to find out, the White Rose Resistance was not only being run, but had been co-founded by none other than her older brother, Hans. <laughs> and we have a picture of, here of them for you this morning. Let's go back one. You see, Sophie understood that evil is powerless if the good are unafraid, and she becomes the youngest and the only female member of the White Rose Resistance. But do you understand her brother Hans was just trying to protect his little sister? At 24, at 24 years old, Hans knew that his activity would likely cost him his death. And it did. They spend the rest of 1942 staying up all night, writing, distributing, anti-Nazi leaflets all around Germany. They would stay up all night and take trains to major German cities and drop off these anti-Nazi leaflets. It was a social media campaign before the digital age. Expose the deeds of darkness. Do you see what's happening? Do you see that you'll be the next generation? And they condemned the crimes of Hitler and mourned the death of the Jews. And in 1943, Hans and Sophie took things to the next level. And on February 18th, 1943, Hans and Sophie, brother and sister, walk onto the campus at the University of Munich. Now, do you understand that the, acad the academic institutions like the clergy were being run by the Nazis? Most of them had been co-opted into obedience or silence. And they begin to distribute their leaflets all around the University of Munich during class time when the halls were quiet. And in this iconic, brave, beautiful scene, Sophie walks to the third floor balcony at the University of Munich and she throws hundreds of leaflets down to the atrium below. <laughs> Domestic terrorists, right? Now, what happens when you throw paper? It goes everywhere. The janitor catches Sophie and Hans in the act, calls the Gestapo, and has them arrested on the spot. Because they were arrested on February 18th, 1943, they missed a meeting they had that afternoon in Munich with a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who had been so incensed and encouraged by their bravery that he had come to meet with them. Bonhoeffer, the pastor, martyr, prophet, and spy. In those four days in prison, it was as if God entered the cell room of Sophie and Hans, picked them up into his hands, and condensed their two decades of energy into four days. And Sophie would speak with a level of political vision and clarity that was lost on the German pulpits. So I want to share with you one of those messages because Sophie is speaking prophetically to us today, church, to stop forgetting the lessons of history, to contend upstream from whence these ideas come and stop picking up the human heartache that we helped create lest you be the next iteration of the ideology of eugenics. Sophie didn't blame the doers of evil, she blamed us. She said the real damage, it's actually caused by all of those millions who just want to survive. You know, the honest men and women that just want to be left in peace, right? Those who don't want their little lives disturbed by anything bigger than themselves. Those with no sides and no causes. Those who won't take measure of their own strength for fear of antagonizing their own weaknesses. Those who don't like to make waves or enemies. Those for whom freedom, honor, truth, and principle, it's just literature. Words, right? Like Lot. Oh. Those who live small, die small. It's the reductionistic approach to life. Because if, if you keep it small, you'll keep it under control. If you don't make any noise, the boogeyman won't find you, FBI, Department of Homeland Security. <laughs> but it's all an illusion because they die too. Those people who roll up their spirits into tiny little balls so as to be safe. Safe from what? Life is always on the edge of death. Narrow streets, they lead to the same place as wide avenues. And a little candle burns itself out just like the flaming torch does. I choose my own way to burn. Um, who 
talks like that at 21. That sounds like C.S. Lewis, G.K. Chesterton, William Wilberforce, or Churchill, for goodness sakes. A young woman with the lion of the tribe of Judah roaring inside of her. A young woman who understood that the culture war was just a proxy war for the spiritual war and that you're to contend upstream and be the good people who don't just believe the truth, but live the truth. Her courage and calm so disturbed her own prison captors that they relaxed the rules and allowed Hans and Sophie to meet with their parents right before being escorted to the guillotine. And Sophie's mother would look Sophie in the eyes and say, remember Jesus, Sophie. And Sophie replied, yes, but you too, mama. Sophie had a cellmate named Elsie Gebel in her same prison cell who survived the Holocaust and later wrote letters to Sophie's parents explaining every final moment and hour of their daughter's life. And she would tell Sophie's parents that your daughter was not so horrified at her impending death. She was horrified at how her mother could survive losing two children on the same day. And Sophie would lay in her prison cell right before the Nazis would escort her to the guillotine. And according to her cellmate, Elsie Gebel, Sophie would look at her barred window with a little bit of skylight and say, how can we expect righteousness to prevail when there's hardly anyone willing to give themselves up individually to a righteous cause. Such a fine sunny day it is, and I have to go now. But what does my death matter if through us thousands of people are awakened and stirred to action? But brothers and sisters, they never saw thousands awakened and stirred to action. The church remained asleep, the academic institutions remained silent, and the good people wouldn't contend for the rights of the Jews. The executioner would later tell interviewers, she went without the flicker of an eyelash. None of us understood how that was possible. I had never seen someone meet his end as she did. Sophie's final words, according to the executioner before the blade fell, was to say, the sun still shines. And Hans's final words were simply, freedom. Reminds me of Bonhoeffer's final words when he was hung naked at Flossenburg Prison on April 9th, 1945, when he said, this is the end. For me, the beginning of life. So brothers and sisters, I am rebuilding the white rose resistance for this generation against our silent but far more deadly holocaust of abortion to build the army of Christian resistance that Hans and Sophie dreamed of but never saw realized to end the holocaust of our day abortion. But brothers and sisters, while rose blossoms may perish in the fall, they reappear in the spring, amen. And so while all of the members of the White Rose Resistance were found and executed, their sacrifice planted the good seeds of resistance in the cultural soil. And your sacrifice will water the seeds of resistance. So one day, thousands will be awakened and stirred to action. The sun will shine again, and we can end this genocide before it's too late. I'm asking you to join the White Rose Resistance. My good friend Charlie Kirk and Turning Point USA Faith are sponsoring this tour. This is the ninth church stop since August. We're doing another church tour in the spring. And yes, I'm asking you for money. So we have a QR code on the screen. I'm telling you, my pastor Rob McCoy calls me the Charlie Kirk of the pro-life movement. I'm not bragging. I'm just telling you I've been raised up to be a pain in the rear, a stick in the eye, and a fly in the ointment to the abortion industrial complex, the spirit of Margaret Sanger and his acolytes, and those who have been slaughtering babies for 65 million, 65 million babies since 1973. This is the Kairos moment for the church to fulfill the legacy of our saints that have gone before us who understood the times that they lived in and were like G.K. Chesterton and C.S. Lewis and were willing to lay down their lives on the line so that you can be free, so we don't fulfill Ronald Reagan's prophetic warning that freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. You didn't pass it to your children in the bloodstream. 
It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Or one day you will spend your sunset years telling your children and your children's children what it once was like to live in the United States where men were free. We are not selfishly demanding our rights. We're exercising our responsibility and stewardship as sons and daughters of the king. So we have merch available for the first time ever on this White Rose Resistance Tour in the foyer. This will take you to our donate page. Jack gave me the permission to ask you for money. There's no pressure, but listen, we're asking for 35 a month. That's, this will hardly cost you your life and certainly not your head like it did Hans and Sophie, but it is life or death for the child in the womb. And there are parents who have not heard from me at UC Berkeley and Stanford and Austin University to contend with the spirit of the age. So I'm asking you to consider 35 a month. Go check out our merch, but listen, I'll see you on the battlefield. Now go out there and give them heaven, will you? <laughs>